And I was attracted and interested in doing this because studying and teaching leadership is something I've been doing for about 30 years. Uh, before I finished college, I was uh, a leadership training, a leadership trainer. Um, don't know why it's something that's so important to me, but it is. So uh, a year ago, David uh, put a question out to the community at the conference. Uh, if anybody's interested in coming to Bilbao, Spain, to help work on this stuff, uh, let me know. And of course, yeah, be a little closer. OK. Um, I wanted to, uh, I, I said, of course, I, I'll go. And uh, so we got started on it. So I'm going to ask a couple. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of uh, relatively rhetorical questions. We don't need to come up with these answers, but I think you know, considering considering what I'm talking about is that on? Here's your time for a bathroom break. Okay, it's working. All right, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'll ask a couple of rhetorical questions. Uh, don't really need the answers, but considering the type of talk I'm giving, I think you might know what the answer, at least my answer would be. You know, how is it large, large groups of people can accomplish something great? If I go to San Francisco, where I used to live, I'm moving to Seattle. If I go to San Francisco and grab a whole bunch of people, that's a large group of people. They're probably not going to accomplish anything. So what's the difference? between a large group of people that does and does not accomplish a lot. Uh, and let's say you have a large group of people and they have a goal. How do they know what they should do? You get more than one person doing the same thing, nobody doing something important. How do they know what they're supposed to do? Can anybody say the first letter of the answer to these questions? Yeah. Yeah. OK, uh, the second, uh, or I, I forgot this one too. I like this. Uh, where does the willingness to do this stuff come from? So accomplishing something great is not easy. It might interfere with your weekend plans. It might be tiring. It actually might be scary, because you might try and fail. How do, are people willing to do that? How are people willing to, to put the effort in to try something hard? Again. So maybe they're born that way. But I would say, with some confidence, after last year of reviewing, like David said, lots of experience, not just my experience, experience of lots of Kanban coaches, lots of the kind of people who have been speaking up here, um, and the, the, the experience that they have and the knowledge that they've developed, we've combed through that, and we've codified an approach to be able to help leaders shape organizational culture. And shaping organizational culture, cultural change, transformation, all of those kinds of things. That's, been, that's a topic that I've been paying attention to for a very long time. And I've gone down different paths to try to help with that. I'm much more confident in the stuff that I'm talking about today than anything I've done in the past. But so. How do they shape this organizational culture? Well, they define the identity, the purpose, the goals, what are we supposed to be doing, and how are we supposed to be doing it? What's the standard? They define this stuff, and then they communicate that effectively so everybody knows. People who disagree can leave, or they can change their opinion. And the people who just need to know will learn, but you have to communicate this stuff effectively. A great strategy that the executives plan in some off-site retreat, if it's not communicated effectively, you'll never realize it. So I'll briefly go through the maturity model. You know, up here, if you squint your eyes very carefully or you look at the, uh, you have this poster yourself, uh, the change management principles are written over here. And the first principle is start with what you do now. We've already heard that today. Don't, don't design a future system. Figure out what you're doing right now first, because you probably don't know. No offense, but you probably have really no idea what's going on in the company. Most likely you don't, because there's no model for that. There's no way for you to know that. 
And also, the company's probably really big, and it's not really possible for you to know everything anyway. But so figure out where you are, start with what you do now. The second principle is gain agreement to pursue an evolutionary path towards improvement and change. Once again, don't design some system and try to force everybody or bribe everybody to adopt your new plan. Don't do that. That's a failure mode. I did that for 10 years. Never worked. Instead, manage the evolutionary change. Set some goals, some hypotheses. I think this is what we should do. If we do this, and I believe this is the kind of result we should get. Find out. And if you're wrong, try something different. But that's managing this process. And we've identified three aspects of an approach to pursuing evolutionary change. And on your posters, just like here, there's three sections. And the three sections are the outcomes. And for each maturity level, there's a quality or a type of outcome you can expect to achieve if your culture reflects the type of practices and the type of attitudes, the ways of communication, the attention to detail that matters regarding you know, actually getting those kinds of outcomes. And then, of course, there's the practices themselves, which on this, this is a poster made for the general public. We have a much larger poster if you go to our event tonight, at, um, or the, the workshop tomorrow, of course. But tonight we have an event at our school. Uh, we have uh, a poster that lists actually all the practices. There's like 150 of them. So the, the practices and implementing those at a given maturity level should get you these results. That's what we've seen. This is empirical, this is evidence-based. People aren't going to be interested in trying new practices. They're not going to be motivated to get better results. And they certainly aren't going to try to change the way they do their jobs, especially if they're good at their jobs. They're not going to be interested or willing to try to do their job differently unless they start to agree with these values. This is a list of values in this column. Another way of saying values, because that can be kind of a vague term, another way of saying it, this is what people think matters. This stuff matters. We have to pay attention to this. We can't neglect this. That would be a value. And so here's an example. Transparency. Does that sound like a Kanban value to you? Transparency? Yeah. I mean, these guys build systems to make transparency more easy. Um, the premise is, if, you don't, if, if transparency is not something that people believe actually matters, they may actually think the opposite. They may think that secrecy is better, keeps them from getting into trouble, or keeps them from losing their control. So if people don't care about transparency, I guarantee you, they're not going to adopt any of these tools. They're not going to put stickies on the wall. They're not going to say, like in the Kanban cartoon, I'm stuck. Who in your company would say, I'm not getting any work done in front of other people, especially a manager, unless they believe that transparency matters, that if they are transparent, it's going to be better. So that's the premise behind this maturity model in the three parts. And I want to assert that the outcomes, that's that third column, the outcomes of your organization are going to be constrained and limited by the culture, by the values of the company, by the culture or the values of the company. So now I want to be very, very clear that I'm not talking about national culture. That's a totally different thing. So here's an example of national culture. Let's say that I, I come someplace and I say, the meeting starts at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. What does that mean? Some places, it means get ready at 10 a.m. to go to the meeting. Maybe the opposite kind of place, it means be at the meeting five minutes before 10, all prepared and ready, so that at 10 a.m. you're ready to start. And then there's maybe a bunch of variation in the middle. 
That would be, that'd be a local culture, a national culture. I'm not talking about that at all. That, all that, that kind of stuff is totally independent of the culture I'm talking about here. Example of Kanban culture values that we're talking about is, for example, transparency. So in one country, transparency might look like one thing. In another country, it looks differently. And then another point I want to make is, in one country, an improvement in transparency looks like one type of improvement. And in another country, an improvement in transparency looks different. That, that's all fine. That, that our model is independent of all of that. So in addition to the culture itself limiting the practices people are willing to adopt, therefore the outcomes they get, the leadership maturity is also going to limit the values and the culture of the company itself, and therefore the practices and therefore the values. So hopefully my uh, talk here is going to explain to, uh, and, and back up these assertions. So let's take, a couple, let's take a look at some examples of each of these levels. So level zero is oblivious in, in as far as uh, outcomes, as far as the maturity model is concerned. A level zero leader is essentially they're abdicating. They're not leading. And so you were promised Game of Thrones. Here's Tom and Baratheon. Does anybody remember who this guy is? Yeah. He actually did the ultimate abdication as a king. He jumped out a window. And it was a very tall building. Uh, I don't blame him. He was a kid. He had expert manipulators, like the best manipulators and political uh, murderers surrounding him. Several kings in, in succession just before him all died within the same like, couple of seasons of TV. So he was not prepared. But uh, essentially, he knew best. He knew his mom, Cersei Lannister, was doing the wrong thing. He knew it wasn't okay for, you know, the, 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 there's like a religious leader, there's some other family leaders. He knew they were all manipulating and doing bad things, but he didn't step up and he didn't, he didn't say, let's do something about it. He never did that. So level zero leadership behavior, you know, they don't really have much influence anyway. Nobody's listening to them. Actually, they're really swayed by other people. So the person may be in charge, they may have the title, the position, but you don't know what they're going to say, you don't know what to expect from them. So if you're working for a person like that, you never really know what to do. That's a serious problem, especially if you get paid by the hour. Uh, and also, they generally don't have a, a vision, like what should happen, what should, what should I do, what should people do, how should things get done. So. I, we, we could just say that basically there isn't leadership at level zero. <coughs> there may be somebody in that position, so that's why I identified it. So level one leadership we're defining as selfish. Now that doesn't mean that everybody in charge of a level one organization is a selfish person. But what we are saying is you don't need to be something more mature than that in order to get level one results. So if you look at the list of results, you rely on individual heroics to get anything done. So like the pizza driver who's trying to deliver pizza on time within 30 minutes drives faster. Um, and then also you're going to get inconsistent outcomes. So imagine, imagine an organization that doesn't deliver consistently and it's actually very unsatisfactory. Well, a selfish person could actually make sure that that kind of stuff is happening. This is Jano Slint. Uh, he died a while back, so you, some of you might not remember him. But essentially, he was in charge of the police of King's Landing. They're called the Gold Cloaks or the City Watch. And this guy is not a good person, in my opinion. He ended up getting beheaded. But uh, his actions led to the arrest and murder of uh, Eddard Stark, or execution. If you think he has, is a traitor. He looks out for himself. Uh, he is in charge. He has what you can call henchmen. In, in, in America, what do you call these kind of people henchmen? He has people do work for him. He is in control. He is leading. He has goals and objectives. He enforces the law sometimes. 
but he also will just align himself with unscrupulous people. And you know, in this, in this case, they're actually going to murder a rival heir to the throne. He's actually probably a legitimate heir and more legitimate than the current king, and they're about to murder the baby. And he will follow orders like that because that's what's good for him. So level one leaders don't necessarily need to have integrity, like what's good for the company, what's good for the com customer. They don't need that in order to at least get the team together to finish some work. So within a team, you might have strong, powerful leadership, and you might be a great person, not a scalawag like Jano Slint, but what you're doing might be at cross purposes to the other teams. What you're doing might be in isolation and doesn't make a difference in overall end-to-end -end flow. So in order to run a team, you don't need a very effective, powerful leader in reality. It's not a requirement to get inconsistent results. You can actually almost have nobody, but you, know, you need to have somebody in charge to get inconsistent results. But that's really the takeaway of this. You know, so if you're, if, you're, if you're in charge of a group of people that is getting inconsistent results, um, maybe consider uh, learning some things to improve the ability for you to influence them to do more. So level two, customer-driven. On this model, this is like below the threshold for fitness for purpose. So the outcomes are still inconsistent, but at least people know who they are and what they're supposed to be doing. That stuff's clear. And so my example for that is J.R. Mormont. He was the Lord Commander of the Black Watch. I'm sorry, the Night's Watch. They wear black clothes. Their nickname is the Crows because of the black clothes. These guys are the ones who stand on this icy wall and defend all of the kingdoms from monsters and bad guys. This guy knows exactly what the Night's Watch is and what it's not. And he knows exactly who the enemy is. And he makes sure everybody's clear on that. And for like, I think, seven or 8,000 years, they've been doing it. He's like the 998th commander. But a level two leader can get relatively consistent results, but as it, you can see, it's, um, they have um, consistent processes. Uh, they still might rely on managerial heroics. So some, some manager can step in and get things to finish on time, like bring people together and actually lead them. But level two leadership, they, you know, they're focusing on just building the, the tribe and strengthening that. Sometimes the tribe is defined by its enemy. That's, that's effective level two leadership. If you have inconsistent outcomes and a whole bunch of disparate teams in your org that don't work together, you can build them into a tribe. And one technique is to identify what is the enemy. The, I don't know if you can read this. I, I'm seeing some yeses. Uh, but yeah, uh, members uh, understood, you know, under J.R. Mormont's watch, they understood what the rules were. They broke them, but they did understand what the rules were. And he enforces their identity. He doesn't, they don't, the Black Watch, or the Night's Watch does not tolerate uh, people who don't participate and act the way they're supposed to. Actually, they kill them. You know, in, including if you run away, they'll kill you. It's almost like a prison. But I want to say, you know, so you know, they have their rituals, so they, they make their oaths. They actually swear off normal things that a normal man would want in their life. They have to forego them, including heirs to the throne, give it up. They give up their land and titles. But I also want to bring up one more thing. Uh, the Night's Watch is over... Like 10, 000, it's like 10,000 years old. So they have a slightly loose interpretation of who they are. Now, this, this is a, a special magic tree for one of the religions in this, in this world. And people go there to pray, and they're making their oath in front of it. When these guys are making their oath, there's like 38 other people making their oath in some church somewhere else. So their policy was, 
you can be whatever religion you want as long as you're going to say this oath because that's our religion and that matters more than your religion. So the, he had total conformity, but there was a little bit of interpretation of how can people conform. That's how he had hundreds of people working for him, not just like a small team. It was a lot of people. So that's level two leadership. Level three leadership, we're defining those, the, you know, the, the aspects of them is they're altruistic. They care about customer service. That's fitness for purpose at level three. And they're purpose-driven. So whose purpose? It's not mine. It's the customer's. So you don't have any greedy kings at level three. So who's our example? Daenerys Stormborn. You probably know who she is even if you didn't watch the show. She usually has dragons crawling around on her. By this is season five, they're really big, so they're actually missing in action right now. But does anybody know what's going on here, what she's doing in this photograph? Way back to season five. She's watching men fight to the death because it's entertaining to the culture and to the people where she lives. And so she's really torn by that. You can see the, the fellow right here. He's actually really enjoying himself. Uh, she didn't like this. She didn't like this at all. But who is she? She's the queen. Who is the customer of the queen? Does a queen have a customer? Yeah, it's the people. So maybe the best thing for her to do to be fit for purpose, meaning fit to rule these people, is to acknowledge and participate in who they are, support them to be who they actually are. She had her design. She's like, this is the way everyone in the world should work. And they were rejecting her leadership. So she compromised. And if you go onto online forums for Game of Thrones, there's millions of bits online of people arguing over, should she have opened the fighting pits or not? So she basically said, I don't think anybody should be murdering each other, especially not slaves murdering each other. And she made a compromise and opened it up. If you volunteer to come fight to the death for entertainment, you're welcome. That's level three leadership. She identified her purpose. She brought people together. Dothraki, Unsullied, uh, a guy from, who was actually supposed to be her assassin, ended up being her number one confidant. Uh, a guy who was kicked out of another kingdom ended up becoming her protector. Uh, she actually got a group of mercenaries who was supposed to fight against her, and she won over their leader and then gained all of them. So she built this big coalition for her vision. But she sacrificed her own personal ambition, at least parts of it, in order to achieve the greater goal. And her goal was to rule was to lead the, you know, the people of that uh, region of the, con or the continent. She allowed the specific way everything was going to work out, like what are the specific practices, the specific policies. She allowed that to kind of emerge. It wasn't just her design only. We saw a little bit of that with the Weirwood tree versus the church and, and making your uh, Night's Watch oath. There was a little bit of variety allowed there. Here she's like actually making some big concessions. So level four. So if you can get to a maturity level of being fit for purpose, it means your customers think you're actually great. They want to give you their money. They like you. You might lose a lot of money in doing that though. You might be on your way to bankruptcy if the way you're delivering value to your customers is killing you. So the difference between three and four is you're managing risk to the point where you can continue to be fit for purpose to the customer, but it's also good for you too. This is actually really responsible behavior. So uh, earlier David mentioned Uber. So Uber was fit for purpose. I was a customer, I got rides, it was like $2 to drive across town during rush hour. That was totally amazing. But they're losing billions of dollars, like he said. The, the employees are going into debt sleeping in their cars, and uh, the taxi uh, drivers in Florida, the first place I ever rode one, were kicking the doors of my Uber driver's car because they hadn't actually, uh, they, they were breaking the law. They were driving and picking up passengers like a taxi 
in a place where only taxis were allowed to go. That was level three fitness for purpose. Level four fitness for purpose is complying with all the expectations and also the economic realities of you have to have a profit or at least break even. You can't just be losing money serving customers because that's actually immoral in a way. You're actually robbing from somebody else to deliver services to these people and someone will pay the price someday. If you're losing lots of money, you're actually robbing people. Someone will pay the price someday. So, level four leader, Sansa Stark. Now, I really wish they gave her more time. Uh, they gave some very specific scenes with very clearly constructed dialogue that if you're a nerd like me and really like Game of Thrones, or Thrones uh, that was a joke from yesterday, um, uh, you'd pick up on it. So there's a scene where she's walking around the, the castle. After the big battle, Jon Snow's gone off to go do something. She's left with trying to like rebuild her, her kingdom after a major battle with all sorts of people been murdered in these horrible ways. And so she's walking around with an entourage, and she's talking about, hey, this armor, you know, we need to rebuild our armor because there will be another war soon. I know we just won a war, but we've got to get ready for the next one. Oh, and by the way, it's getting colder, so you should cover those uh, metal pieces with leather so the soldiers don't get cold. And then she was asking questions like, how much food do we have? Who's making food? Who, who's still alive to make food? Can we get that food into a place where we can count it and track it and keep, you know, control the inventory? She was being responsible and taking responsibility for the economics of what was going on. How, how are things operating what do we need to do now to prevent a problem in the future? Other point I wanted to make about her, and these are more subtle in later seasons, you know, she always wanted to be the queen. She had this dream from when she was a little girl. Her life didn't turn out the way she thought, that's for sure. It did not turn out at all the way she thought it was going to turn out. But... You know, in spite of you know, knowing what she wanted and having her goals, she hedged her bets. One example of that, do you guys know who Littlefinger is? Lord uh, Baelish, Peter Baelish. And anyway, he sold her to a really terrible person who did terrible things to her, like extremely terrible things to lots of people. She kept him around. She stayed in her, in her chambers alone with him, getting his counsel. So... She could assess people. She knew he wasn't an imminent threat, and he was, had some value to teach her, but he was also a liar and a deceiver. So she took whatever he told her with a grain of salt. So she had a terrible person. She was able to manage her relationship with terrible people to learn from them. She's also the only one who really knew there's, it's impossible to win the battle against the Boltons even though they had a giant and all that stuff. And she took steps to increase the number of soldiers that they had. She got a cavalry from some faraway place. So level five leadership. You know, I, I couldn't find any actual kings or lords that I would consider to be level five in the story, which is kind of sad. But it's actually a very realistic TV show. But I, I settled on the, the maesters. So these guys are like the, the intelligentsia. If there was a, you know, the, the Library of Alexandria, it's these guys. They're like the university of the whole world, the only college there is. They have all the books. All of them are studying all day long. And what for? Why are they doing that? Because they want to be right. It's nothing to do with their ego. They just don't want to make mistakes, and they don't want other people to make mistakes. So their perfectionism is facts and the truth. And so they survey everything, and they find stuff that's like, no, nah, this is not useful, this is not true, or this is true, and this is true, and they're in conflict, but let's like study it for another 5,000 years. But that's the kind of people these guys are. And I mentioned 5,000 years. The institution that they're in, the citadel, it's like five, 6,000 years old. 
So level five leadership, they're actually thinking, how can I have this system produce consistent and best-in-class results? Not just how can we pursue best-in-class results, they're actually able to take another step back and think, how can I make a business? How can I build something that can do this? And essentially, in a way, that's what they're doing. They're not really ruling, but they rule themselves. And I would say that their institution is definitely a level five institution. They have a very long time horizon. They know, yeah, the winter is coming. There's these monsters and undead people. They actually have evidence that that could never possibly happen but they're open to, you know, maybe it's true. But let's see how it turns out. Let's not suddenly change everything based on hearsay or based on, you know, what if. And uh, one last point I want to make about this, um, which I, this is what convinced me of their level five leadership, is there's a scene where Sam, he's like a young kind of bumbling, very nice guy, but, you know, He's, he's young, and he's not a 50, 60-year-old experienced uh, uh, master of anything. He has uh, encountered a person with a very terrible disease that's like eating him apart, and he's going to die. And Sam has some type of affinity with him. And it also turns out that Sam has looked into millions of books. I don't know how he found this book, but he found one of the books that has instructions on how do you cure that. And so he says, I want to I help him. And of course, the masters say, well, you can't because that cure doesn't work, and the person who tried during that cure also died. So, you know, it's against the rules. Can't do it. So Sam said, okay. And when everybody left, Sam snuck in to the person's room, and he tried this experiment, which is like a horrible, very painful experiment, but he gave it a shot. And it turns out it worked. The guy survived. He had imminent death, and he survived. He turned around a terminal disease. And Sam himself didn't get sick. He wasn't punished for breaking the rules. So the experimentation in their institution is encouraged. It's, it, 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 there's no hubris. It's not, you can do anything. That's not their message. The message is, be sure you know what you're doing. And if you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. But go ahead and find out. That's what keeps them from having a cult and having an opinion that 3,000 years later ends, ends their, their legacy. They continue to evolve. So level six leadership. Which one of these three people you see standing up is a level six leader? There's somebody seated, seated too. Do you know who that is? Sansa Stark. But the three standing, who, which one's a level six leader? Uh, nobody said, you, you know his name? His name is Tormund. Nobody's brought him up yet. But I've heard uh, um, Daenerys and Jon Snow, heard both names. What is a level six leader? What defines that? Based on what you know already from you know, quickly looking at this poster that you have or from hearing us talk about it for a while, what defines a level six leader? He said can, they can reinvent themselves. They can reinvent the organization. Which organization did he reinvent? Yeah, absolutely. Any others? The North in general. Looking pretty level six. How about Daenerys? Where did she come from? Nothing, right? A level zero leader brother ruining her life sold her as a slave, essentially. That's where she started. So where is she here? It's a Winterfell castle. And who came with her? Thousands and thousands of people from another continent. People who ride horses and run around killing and, and, and uh, raping and pillaging. 
They don't do that in this place. So she actually changed them. Basically taking the Mongol Empire and turning them into something else. Level 6 leader. How about this guy? Tormund Giant Spain. He's essentially the successor to a guy named Mance Raider. They, they call him the King Beyond the Wall. He brought together all these totally independent tribes that actually murdered and ate each other in, to some degree. And he got them all to unite to try to uh, break through the wall and avoid these terrible monsters. Is he a level six leader? What kind of leader is this guy? You know, we'll get to that guy later. But yeah, if we think about what is it that defines a level six leadership? They're focused on the values spending most of their time on this column here. Do I see evidence that makes me believe that these people in my organization actually care about this stuff and they think it matters? Evidence does not include a poster that says diversity or leadership development or respect. A poster on the wall with that word is not evidence of the values. So level six leaders learn to see the evidence. Like, do people actually care about this stuff? Because if not, it's really the, the job of the leader is to foster that value in the culture of the company that they're working with, the organization they're working with. Well, one of the points um, uh, we make in uh, other uh, material is uh, this guy, Nelson Mandela, uh, the, the anecdote is he let go of managing the bus system because the bus system in the country was all messed up. And he's like, you guys take care of that. I'm going to build the Rainbow Nation. I'm going to turn two people who hate each other into two people who are on the same side. So you can deal with the buses. In the movie, or in the show, Jon Snow, he's actually somewhat famous for never being in the kingdom. He's never in Winterfell ruling. He's always all over the place on all these adventures. And Sansa actually became queen of Winterfell because she was running it. He was trying to unite a bunch of warring kingdoms and actually uh, you know, enemies for a single purpose. Um, they can persuade people to give up on their ambitions to pursue a greater goal. That's something common with all of them as well. And then finally, and you can see as soon as the perp, if you watch season eight, which if you did, my apologies, it was not a good season. But <laughs> if you watch season eight, you can see that as soon as the purpose was gone, the Night King shattered into bits of ice. Oh, sorry. Yeah. As soon as, soon as the purpose was over, you can anticipate this. You know enough about uh, uh, Kanban and, and that kind of stuff. You, you'd be able to anticipate this. As soon as the purpose was gone, there wasn't any effort he could do to get warring and enemies to work together anymore. But a level six leader puts a tremendous amount of energy into tolerating huge differences. This office does it this way. This team does it a different way. That country region does sales and marketing like this. And that doesn't quite work with our ERP system. So we have to make all these APIs and blah, blah, blah. But they know it's worth it because that's how they're going to be able to last and not split apart. It's the only way. So they think that this is where their effort should go, not into running the bus system or not into finding out how much grain do they have. They delegate that to hopefully level four leaders. No clock on here. So I'm going to go like this. It's not like you're boring me. I just need to check the time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So how do we provide guidance for leaders? Kanban promises pragmatic, actionable, evidence-based guidance. So this is some new stuff. Did we just make this up? No. How do we provide practical guidance for leaders? OK, it's. It's in here. This is very information rich. You could, I, I could spend 
an hour talking about that. So, sorry, you're not going to be a fully trained level six leader by the end of my talk today. I want to introduce this, especially introduce that there is a way for us to provide practical, actionable guidance to leaders to do the job that only a leader can do. You already know we have management practices. We've got leadership practices. And only a leader can do them. A coach can't do them. What's the difference between a leader and a coach? We'll get to that. A leader is the one who can influence whether people care about these things or not. If the leader demonstrates that it's not important to them, then you might be punished for doing the right thing. You might be rewarded for doing the wrong thing. If leaders don't care about this stuff, the people are not going to care about this stuff. That's a very important role. I'd say there's a crisis of leadership in most companies I've ever been to, and I've been to a lot, because they're not doing that job. They're not defining who people should be, how they should act, what the goals are, and what the standards are. They're not, they're not defining it, first of all, and they're certainly not communicating it. So how do leaders do their job? You can look at it in two parts, two sides to leadership. It's not halves, it's more like sides of a coin. And I've already alluded to this. They make decisions. So that's one difference between a coach and a leader. Leaders are supposed to make decisions. That's their job. Coaches give advice. That's a big difference. And then the second part is uh, influence. And when I'm talking about, you know, get people to be willing or communicate that stuff, that's what I'm talking about. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about what other people should do by myself. So I might be doing lots of decision making, but nobody knows. That's not really leadership. I also made the joke about, let's say, you hire McKinsey, you go off to some resort, you make some big strategy, blah, 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 here's all of our plan, and then you go back to work, and nobody ever hears about it. I actually used to do that. I, was one of, I used to facilitate executive off-sites. I did that kind of stuff. It doesn't work. You need to communicate the stuff. So let's take a look at uh, the decision side of it. So the, what a leader decides is really, that's what's going to shape the culture. It's what they're deciding. Policy, minimal standards, what to start, what to delay, what to never do. Those decisions shape the culture. So we define decision filters to help guide the type of decisions leaders make. And each of these decision filters is associated with one of the values. So once again, if you get your magnifying glasses out and you look at the list of values here, each one of these has at least one decision filter associated with it. The filter, once again, is a way to shape and guide the leader's decision making. We're not telling people what decisions to make, if that's impossible. But what should they think about? What matters? What criteria matters when they're making those decisions? So let's look at maturity level three and the values within that. And we'll use Daenerys Stormborn, first of her name, queen of Slaver's Bay and Marine right here. This is season five. Let's look at her and uh, have a little bit of fun. How did she do? So here's the first value, customer service. It's in this list here. The decision filter associated with that, so guidance for a leader. If you want people to actually care about and take actions that will serve customers better, the leader should act with the intent to meet customer expectations over the intent to meet personal or organizational goals. We had an example of Daenerys doing that. not a quiz. Anyway, uh, yeah, she opened the fighting pit. 
She didn't want that. But she needed to rule the people. Balance, another value. The aphorism or the uh, decision filter is pull rather than push. So that's somewhat metaphorical. Maybe some experience with Kanban will help you understand this better. But just in general, the concept of pushing change on people can get some bad results. David used the term earlier today, overreaching. This is what overreaching results in. In this scene, there's an insurgency where these guys with gold masks are murdering everybody in the number one symbol of her agreement to start getting along better with her people. It was too late. So this insurgent group wanted to kill everybody there to ruin the event. Overreaching has consequences. You can call it organizational resistance. Another one, fitness for purpose. That's a familiar one for most of you. That's a level three value. And the decision filter that makes sure you are doing things that will lead you to fitness for purpose is the market is going to decide what is good enough. It's not you. It's not your genius. Not the product manager. It's the market. And I'm, I keep coming back to this one. Her decision to open the fighting pits, as far as she was concerned, that was wrong. But she isn't the one who gets to decide everything, regardless of what she says in season eight. Here's another example. The market decides what's good enough. This is an old phone with a button on it. Remember Steve Jobs? First of his name. <laughs> he didn't want a button. But the market decided this was good enough, and yeah, he basically reinvented phones by releasing this. So a word about uh, evolutionary change in this context. So we have initial practices in this uh, season five, Marine, the capital. Slavery. Daenerys thought, nah, I don't like that. Slavery, no good. I'm going to abolish slavery. So a change. No more slavery. She evaluates that. Mm, not good enough. Uh, this fighting pits, the people chopping each other up for entertainment, abolished. And she saw what kind of feedback she got from the people about that, which was an insurrection. So she rolled it back. So you don't always know exactly how things are going to turn out. That's why you need to keep your eyes open and pay attention and have some feedback loops in place. Deeper maturity level practices include those feedback loops. Sometimes you made things change to the point where you can't go back, so you have to roll forward. But you have to pay attention. So another value at level three, leadership at all levels. What we want and we think is important that all levels of the organization have leadership. People making decisions and influencing others to follow through on those decisions. Value autonomous action over waiting for people or expecting people to wait for permission. Let people improvise. There's a problem with that though. This guy took initiative. There was a bad criminal who everybody hated and knew he was a bad person. He did something wrong. He was caught. This guy killed him. According to the rules that he lives by, who knows how many thousands of years those rules have been around, he had to kill the guy. But it was against the new law. So sometimes when you let people improvise and take initiative for stuff, there's a risk they're going to do things the wrong way or they're going to do the wrong thing. So we got another value for that. So unity and alignment. Leadership at all levels and unity and alignment, really, you need them both because they complement each other. Communicate intent and the desired outcome. But you don't need to bother telling everybody exactly what to do. So if this guy understood not just what he should do, but if he understood what the purpose behind all of the actions and what, what the overall long-term goal was, 
he might have hesitated before he made his revenge killing. He was devoted to the queen. Just made a mistake. Uh, the last one I want to bring up is short-term results. Valuing short-term results like it matters that we achieve something. Act tactically to achieve short-term objectives even at the expense of strategic objectives. Borrow money to pay for things. Overall, we want to make a profit. Borrowing money puts us into debt. We end up paying more for the thing. That's a tactical decision. And what was the purpose of these dragons? What is Daenerys Stormborn's, one of her titles? Mother of dragons. She's locked him up in a cave. Obviously, dragons don't belong in caves. Bats do, but not dragons. The one that didn't get stuck in this cave was like four times as big as the other ones. So th this was actually really harmful for them. Why did she do it? Does anybody remember why did she lock up these dragons? They killed children. Can't do that. <laughs> so she took her kids, essentially, and locked them up. That's not who she is. The only people in the world that care about her are dragons. But she acted tact tactically to achieve a result, which was a people, a couple of kingdoms that were in rebellion and weren't following her leadership. She made a concession here. So how did she do? How did Daenerys do in Marine? I'll say this at least. She continued to take risks, meaning she made decisions. She made calls. And she learned from them. She's smart enough to keep some other people around that she could listen to. She lost a lot of those advisors later in the, in the, in the seasons. But she continued to take risks and learn. At least she could do that. We know that she was doing that. But the takeaway is leadership is not easy. It's not easy to make these kinds of decisions. So I want to uh, close here. And uh, is there time for questions? Five minutes? So if you want to ask me what happened at the end of season eight or why did the writers decide to do something with the show, I'll talk to you tonight about that. <laughs> but if you have questions about the maturity model, and then specifically what would be something you could do with leadership in your company to start caring about the kinds of stuff that we have come to understand and be willing to implement it, please. You can also say, I'm asking for a friend, but they want to know this, that you can do that too. Yeah. So most of the leaders that I've worked with, uh, they believe that their leadership style is right because it's got them to where they're at. They're uh, right. So how do you get them to start working with some of these things that you've outlined here to change and adapt their leadership style in a changing world? Um, so uh, I said they're right, and there's a quote from Jon Snow about 600 times in eight seasons. He said, you're right, when he's about to correct somebody. Uh, but usually he was talking to people who had authority, or at least a lot of autonomy, and he was not in control of them. So he first acknowledged that, yeah, you're right. And the fact is they are. They got them to where they are. But the question is, where are they? So uh, David mentioned earlier this, this dynamic. Um, the slide was like a box with an arrow going this way and this way and then another box, and it mentioned a happy. So people are uh, working in whatever equilibrium state. This is our process. These are our systems, the kind of results we get, and we're happy with it. I go to work every day. I enjoy myself. And so coaches and leaders both 
can reveal facts that are difficult to swallow, hard to swallow truths or um, uncomfortable information. Part of what the benefit of transparency is this, so that they can see there's a gap between you know, them, yeah, sure, they're getting the results that they're getting because of their leadership. But relatively speaking, the results kind of suck. And there's other people out there who are getting way better results. And it's not because they have more money or better people or, you know, if only, if only, if only. It's because of what the leadership is doing. Tolerating new practices. Um, dealing with the conflict between people who stopped estimating and the people who want those numbers. So, yeah. If, if, the, if they came here and they're reading this and going to buy the book in September, yeah. But if not, they need people like you to influence them. They need people like you to talk to them. So once again, you don't go to a leader and say, you know what? You don't measure up. You're not good enough. And I'm here to explain to you how you could be better. Uh, that doesn't work. I tried that. <laughs> but to, to acknowledge that, yes, what you have done has gotten you to where you are. Do you like where you are right now? So if the answer is yes, find somebody else to work with. Go around that rock. If the answer is no, I want to get better, well, they probably can make a list of if only right now. And they probably already have that list. And they bring it to meetings. Like, we need more money, we need more time, blah, blah, blah. So if you can also introduce, well, here's some other things. It's not if only. You could do these right now. That's it. But this is, this is not an immediate change. You're yeah. actually changing the way people think about themselves and about how the world works. Yeah. Steve, to answer Brett's question, leadership developments like any other kind of coaching, the, the person has to invite it. Mm. They do have Good to point. pull it. So if you have someone who's not inviting it and you've held the mirror up to this is the performance of your organization and it's being constrained by your own capabilities as a leader and they are quite happy with that, then um, you are stuck, right? But if you hold the mirror up and help them reflect on the fact that they themselves may need to develop further if the organizations to get further if they're to if they're to achieve their ambition then they invite the leadership development um, but without the pool without the invitation i think it's it's very difficult that's true i would say it's actually unethical to uh try to help somebody change their sense of themselves who they are and uh, what they value if they're not asking for it. That's, that's like coercion force. I, I don't think that's even a good thing to do. I, I think it's fair to say that, that the military have codified leadership and leadership development. So if someone signs up as, a, as an officer cadet, then at least going into officer training school at the beginning, there is the potential for them to be a general or an admiral or something coming out the, the, the other end that uh, the military will push the leadership development and try to take the individual as far as they can. But that's very difficult to achieve in a, a, a commercial environment. Yeah, in a commercial environment, people haven't signed on the line that they belong to the organization now. So we have to be gentler. Yeah. So there's a core difference that someone goes to business school, they graduate, they join a company at some executive level position, they're in charge of a budget, they might... Could we please fix the yeah. audio? Um, and... Well, did I? Hello? Ah. Okay, this one works. Co consequently, the, um, the, their motivation may be purely selfish. 
right? They want the higher ranking position, the fancy paycheck and so on. Well, uh, I, I, I think that's unlikely with military officers. Yes, they could be selfish, but they, they're putting their life at risk. They ultimately, um, they choose to join the service and who knows what happens in world politics. They put their lives at risk. So it's much more likely to be a, a higher maturity, altruistic motivation. Um, in commercial environments, someone can aspire to a leadership position for purely selfish motives. Okay, well thank you very much. If you're interested in learning more about this stuff, the kind of classes that we put together, about it or any of the material that we're going to be coming out with in the fall, ask us, please. Uh, I really care about this. I'd like to share it with as many people as I can. Thank you.